Hello, welcome to Modern 2, and in this slide lecture we're going to look at the art of the second half of the 20th century and we're going to ease on into the 21st century as well. This time period, the 20th century, was such a time of great change for humanity, and this is expressed in the art. There's so many new movements in the arts that we can't really cover them all here, but instead we're going to look at some of the major influences of this century. To begin with, it will be helpful to break the art down into three or four, four currents that affected artists at this time. First we have abstraction, which is defined as having only intrinsic form with little or no pictorial representation. And this was a response by artists to the world that seemed to be changing at its very roots. Abstraction is an exploration of the mind into the nature of reality. Now there is a slight difference between abstraction and um, non-representational art. Usually abstraction has a little hint of something recognizable in it, where non-representational is usually just pure, pure pigment on canvas without really having anything that the mind can relate to. So we have abstraction. And then let's move on to expressionism. Now we've already discussed this a little bit, but the easy way to remember expressionism is that it's got a strong emotional content and the viewer responds emotionally. Very easy to remember because expressive means expressing emotions generally and expressionism means emotional art. Then we have fantasy and realism which deal with the world of the imagination and with presenting the world around us in precise detail so that we see it in a new way. Hey, let's get that definition. I wonder if I can highlight it here. I'll just tell you. Realism has to do with presenting the world around us in precise detail so that we see it in a new way. Write that down. And then there is this larger concept beyond all these little pieces, which is modernism, which is something that's constantly changing. And it's interesting that now, as we are in this, you know, well into the 21st century, modernism is now kind of, well, old-fashioned. And we have something else called contemporary art that seems to have followed up modernism. Ah, oh, the world of art. Definitions, definitions. This guy's interesting. Pierre Mondrian. He was a Dutch man, and he was strongly influ influenced by the Cubists. Who, who founded Cubism? Picasso and Brock remember that. Now Mondrian started a movement that he called the style or the style. He believed that there were two kinds of beauty, kind of sensual, emotional, subjective kind of beauty, and he was not into that. But that, that he believed that there was a higher, a rational, universal beauty independent of emotional influences. This is actually very much like Plato believed from the Greek time. His style, Mondrian's style, can be linked to the Bauhaus school. As he attempted to make this purely rational art, he eliminated images that represented objects and their curves. This would be called non-representational. It's also an abstract work of art, but you see it doesn't really look like anything. He felt that images that had um, represented objects or images that had curves would be associated with this sensual emotional appeal and he was not into that at all. In fact, Mondrian was convinced that nature with its irregularity, let me start over, Mondrian was convinced that nature with its irregularity was the source of humanity's distress. He actually avoided going outdoors and he lived in a very Spartan apartment. They say that Mondrian would go into a restaurant and he would say, please do not make me look out the window. He didn't want to see that messy nature. I have a different point of view, but you know what? This guy's a great artist and this particular painting is so widely reproduced. You may have seen it before. Now here's another guy, uh, Vasily Kandinsky. He had a very successful law career and then he saw a painting of Monet's Haystacks, the Impressionist artist. He was so moved that he gave up his position as a professor of law and he dedicated himself to the study of art. Now he was strongly influenced also by the early Expressionists and he used a lot of symbolism, but he was primarily interested in the sheer force of color and how it impacted the viewer. 
And I will say that I saw a couple of original Kandinsky's at this uh, recent show at Crystal Bridges, a traveling show. And it, I was so impressed by the work where I had not really appreciated it before I was able to see an original. And I think this just makes the case for the value of going to a museum. Same with Mark Rothko, who we're looking at now, on that same um, plug for going to a museum. There's actually a Rothko piece in the permanent collection at the museum, but the one that they had in the traveling exhibition that's now moved on was probably one of his strongest works. I'd say much stronger than the permanent collection there, the one that you would see if you just went and walked through the main gallery. So it really led me to appreciate this artist more. Who is this artist? His name is Mark Rothko. Uh, and we'll get to him. After World War II, there's a whole movement from the art world as it moved from Paris to New York as, as like the hippest place for artists. Many of the most influential artists in Europe had fled Nazi persecution and they ended up in New York City. There was also a program started in this country during the Depression. It's called the WPA or the Works Projects Administration. You need to know about the WPA. This was a program that gave money to artists to create public works. Many, many well-known artists got their start in the WPA. As these diverse artists all converged on New York City, a movement called Abstract Expressionism was born. Note, this is different than Expressionism, and it's different than abst Abstraction. This is Abstract Expressionism influenced by the Expressionists, the Cubists, the Surrealists, and many other factors, ranging from technology as an influence, even Zen Buddhism influenced these guys. Although these influences did have their place in the formation of the movement, these, the artists that formed the Abstract Expressionists wanted to break conventions. And here we have Mark Rothko. He painted in a style called color field painting. Color field painting in which the force of colors are seen as more important than any images in the work. He painted in a realistic style early in his career, but in the 50s he painted a series of canvases that were only squares of color, and this is what this artist is really best known for. So remember color field painting and abstract expressionism. Let's look at Henry Moore. He was one of the most influential sculptures of the 20th century. He worked for more than seven decades, and his work continued to evolve with the time. This is an early work called Reclining Figure, 1929. And here he's making an effort to kind of pay homage to the uh, work of classical Greece and to tribal art. He's based his figure on a sculpture from the Parthenon, but he's rendered it in a style that looks a lot more like South American tribal art. Now, Rodin, I mean, Henry Moore got ever, ever more away from realism as he became, got more abstract. He seems to be trying to capture the essence of a form without rendering the form. So what we have above right is, an, is a famous sculpture by another artist, Rodin, called The Thinker. See, The Thinker, we've all heard of that. Very classical in a, uh, and in a very kind of emotional pose. This was actually very radical for its time when it was created in the mid-1800s, but when you compare it to the female figure by Henry Moore, it looks very conservative. So here we have him moving even further away from real representation. I just love this one, and that's because of the story behind it. Another important artist of the New York School was named Barnett Newman. He was primarily a painter, and he made these large color field paintings, sort of like Rothko. But he also created many sculptural works. And through these works, Newman wanted to communicate the isolation of humanity's lonely condition as it moved into the modern world. I wonder if we can relate to that now, as we're all isolated with our computers and phones. Something to think about. So the sculpture to the left was conceived and created between the years 1963 and 1967. This was a time of great upheaval in this country and in the whole world. So what he's done here is he's used the image of the Egyptian pyramid to portray human spiritual aspirations. And you see the obelisk that's pointing down on top of it? 
That represents how these aspirations have been undermined by the materialism and the speed of the late 20th century. In a hopeful twist, he has the two worlds meeting in this delicate balance on the top of the pyramid. This particular version of the sculpture is installed outside the Rothko Chapel in Houston, and it's dedicated to the memory of Martin Luther King, who was shot soon after the sculpture was completed. So let's look at mobiles. You've probably seen mobiles maybe in a baby crib. The kinetic sculpture is what the uh, original creator of mobiles called them. Alexander Calder, he was the first artist to create these kinetic sculptures. And they're sculptures that were in motion, constantly changing as they responded to airflow around them. They were made of metal, wire, rope, found objects, and they were given the name mobile by Marcel Duchamp. So when you hear the name mobile, it was based on an origin. the first ones were done by Alexander Calder. You might want to le learn that. He was kind of a curmudgeon old dude, and he worked in the middle of the 20th century. He often has a lot of humor in his work. So let's look at op art, which means optical art, messing with your eyes a little bit. So here the artist manipulates light and dark, contrast colors or patterns of line, in order to confuse the eye or to challenge visual perceptions. This style of art was very popular in the 1960s. Above left is a painting by Richard Anaskowicz from 1970, and it measures 9 feet by 6 feet. And I can imagine if you were standing in front of it, it would be vibrating. At this recent exhibition at Crystal Bridges, I, I did see some of the op art. Um, which is kind of interesting. I mean, it's like it's almost like it's a trick to me. It's a gimmick. You can fool the eye. Now let's go a completely different direction and look at um, Thomas Hart Benton. This is a truly great artist of of our area. In fact, just to go off on a little um, jaw, a little tangent, this artist Thomas Hart Benton testified before Congress in the early 1970s because he used to like to float the buffalo. And Congress was considering uh, putting a dam that would have turned our Buffalo River oh, into another big lake. So Thomas Hart Benton was like the celebrity guy who went and testified before Congress and as the result of his testimony they made the National Park which became the Buffalo River. So there you go. This guy's a hero for those of us who love to float the buffalo. Okay, as abstraction was becoming a movement in the cities, there was this other movement called regionalism. Now regionalism is another term that I do want you to remember. Regionalism. It's another one that's easy because you think about it. It's, um, it's a response to the urbanization of American life. And what regionalism does is it romanticizes rural life that's kind of slipping away. Um, this Ozark artist, Thomas Hart Benton, was a well-known regionalist. He was born in Neosho, Missouri, and he attended the Art Institute of Chicago. He came back to the Ozarks in the 20s, and he painted these scenes of the common people and executed a number of murals as part of the WPA program. His murals still exist in the Missouri State House and in several post offices around the state. So you can see here with his work the influences of non-representational and emotional content, but um, there's still, you have both of these influences together, the realism and the abstraction. So he did teach at the Kansas City Art Institute and he had many famous pupils there. One of them was Jackson Pollock. The piece to the right is called The Ballad of the Jealous Lover of Big Green Valley, and it's based on a folk song of the time. And if you look at the guy playing harmonica down there, kind of the middle of the, uh, in the middle of the painting on the bottom, that's supposed to be his portrait of his student, Jackson Pollock. Oh, Jackson Pollock. So Jackson Pollock studied with Thomas Hart Benton, and uh, he started painting realistically with Benton. Of his teacher, he said, he drove his kind of realism at me so hard that I bounced right into non-objective painting. So eventually, Pollock was going to start this revolutionary style of painting that he called action painting. To the left, we see a very early work by Jackson Pollock, and to above, a work by his teacher. We'll continue with this in part two. 
and we'll begin with talking about the action painting of Jackson Pollock. Thanks for listening.